before I, st I start the sermon, I want to also say a special word of thanks to our quilters. We are bringing some boxes of quilts with us to North Carolina. And so those will be very well received. <laughs> Made with lots of love um, to keep people warm. As you have seen, the temperature's already starting to drop up there. So they will be put to immediate good use. So thank you, thank you quilters. Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. So we're in the narrative lectionary and we have started this journey through the Bible. Uh, one of the beautiful things about the narrative lectionary is it really helps us to follow the story of God and God's people. But I got to tell you, between what happened last week and what's happening today, a whole lot of stuff happens. And it's actually really important to kind of put into context about what's going on in our lesson for today. So uh, we're, gonna, we're gonna kind of back up and fill in some of those blanks. So last week you talked about, uh, you heard the story of uh, Passover, the institution of Passover as the Hebrew people were uh, clamoring, yearning, praying for a place to finally be able to leave Egypt at where they had been in captivity as slaves for hundreds of years. And there were all the plagues, and then the 10th plague, of course, is the, the angel of death that comes and the killing of the firstborn, and God instructs the people to take the blood of a lamb and put it on the doorpost. You can see in that picture, kind of putting, painting the blood on the doorpost and the lintel, and, and so that the angel of death would pass by them or pass over their home and not hurt them, which is where we get the word Passover from. Well, that's all the way back in Exodus 13. Our reading for today is Exodus 32. So do some quick math. Um, and it's, it's pretty substantial stuff that happens. So we're going we're gonna to see what is going on. But at that time when Moses was with, uh, with the people, he says, remember this day, meaning that Passover that moment where they're really on the cusp of finally being able to leave and they are able to be led out of that uh, captivity. Remember this day on which you came out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, because the Lord brought you out from there by the strength of his hands. He is saying, remember what has happened and remember who it is that has caused it all to happen. Remember what has happened and who it is that has caused it all to happen. And so we, we follow the, the Hebrew people as they're leaving and we hear about the pillar of cloud and the pillar of fire that guides them, uh, that goes out in front of them, leading them, pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night uh, to lead them along the way. And so the people are literally led by God. God is leading them, going before them as they are finally leaving the place of their slavery and looking for a new future. You know, in the story, well, what happens? Pharaoh finally decides, you know what? I'm not gonna let this slide. I'm mad. And I said I was gonna let him go, but you know what? I'm gonna just go ahead and chase after them. So Pharaoh and his army, they get in chariots and they start pursuing the Israelites. So Pharaoh draws near and, and Coming in great fear, the Israelites cried out to the Lord, and they said to Moses, was it because there were no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us, bringing us out of Egypt? Is this not the very thing we told you in Egypt? Let us alone so that we can serve the Egyptians, for it would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. Sounds like they're struggling a little bit with the concept of faith already. But Moses says to the people, do not be afraid, stand firm, and see the deliverance that the Lord will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall never see again. The Lord will fight for you and have you only have to keep still. That's got to be against all of their intuition, right? They want to run. They want to flee. They want to do something. And Moses says, 
God's got this. Just keep still. So the angel of God, who was going before the Israelite army, moved behind them, and the pillar of cloud moved from in front of them and took its place behind them. It came between the army of Egypt and the, ar- and the people of Israel. And then, of course, probably one of the most memorable scenes in all of the entire Bible, uh, the parting of the Red Sea. Moses stretched out his hands over the sea. The Lord drove the sea back by the strong east wind all night and turned the sea into dry land. And the waters were divided. The Israelites went across the sea on dry ground. And they went to a new place, to a new land, to cross that sea. Thus the Lord saved Israel from that day from the Egyptians. And Israel saw the Egyptians dead on the seashore. Israel saw the great work that the Lord did against the Egyptians. So the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and in his servant Moses. You know, you would have thought that seeing the ten plagues, seeing the coming of the angel of death, seeing all the things that God had already done to liberate them, free them, the miracles that were performed, seeing how Moses took his staff and stuck it in the water in the Nile and and it turned up, you know, all of, all of those amazing, miraculous things, and yet they waver in their faith. But here we're told, so the people feared the Lord and believed in the Lord and his servant Moses. So it sounds like, okay, we're good. They're out of Egypt, Pharaoh's army gone, they're safe, smooth sailing from here. Not so fast. When they came to Mara, they couldn't drink the water because it was bitter. So the people grumbled against Moses, saying, what are we to drink? There the Lord made for them a statute and an ordinance, and he put them to the test. He said, if you will listen carefully to the voice of the Lord your God and do what is right in his sight and give heed to his commandments and keep all his statutes, I will not bring upon you any of the diseases that I brought upon the Egyptians, for I am the Lord who heals you. And so he instructed Moses to take a piece of wood and throw it in the water, and the water became sweet so that the Israelites could drink it. But Moses, we're hungry. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, this is going to start sounding like a broken record, by the way. If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat and ate our fill of bread, for you have brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. I can just imagine Moses' blood pressure right about now. (laughs) And Moses complains to God, what am I going to do with these people? They won't shut up. They won't stop complaining. The Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. In that way, I will test them whether they will follow my instructions or not. All right? A little suspense. And God says, then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. How is it that they don't know that already? Hello? He just parted the Red Sea, so that they could walk across. He delivered them from Egypt. And yet, he knows their faith is still so shallow, so vulnerable, so fragile. So he sends manna. The the word manna literally in Hebrew means, what the heck is this? 
mysteriously. That's what it means. Mana. What is this? This stuff. But he sends the manna, sends them quail, but he tells them a couple of things. Remember, he said he was going to put them to the test. So he says, all right, don't try to gather any more than what you need. Don't hoard. Don't try to put some extras away. Only take what you need for each and every day. What do you think happens here? <laughs> eh, they do. All right. So don't gather manna on the Sabbath. This is one of the ways that God is setting the Sabbath apart as a day of rest, a day to honor the Lord, and a day to just to be with God and not be distracted by other things. So don't gather manna on the Sabbath. How does that one go? Eh. They fail. The Lord says to Moses, how long will you, meaning the Israelites, Refuse to keep my commandments and my instructions. It just seems like they just can't get it right for even a day. Moses, we're thirsty again. But the people thirsted for water and the people complained against Moses. Broken record. Why did you bring us out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our livestock with thirst? So the Lord says to Moses, go ahead of the people, take in your hand the staff with which you stuck in the Nile. That same staff, he still got in his hand. Strike the rock and water will come out of it so that the people may drink. Which is what happens. Finally, they get to a place called Mount Sinai. And Mount Sinai is a place where they encamp. They know that it is a place Moses has led them to say, we are going to settle right here for a while because it is here that we are going to meet with God and hear from our God. And so they, they get to Mount Sinai. That is actually, by the way, a, a, a photograph of, of the, one of the Mount Sinai's that it could be that that place was. Uh, and Moses it says went up to God uh, the Lord called him from the mountain thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles wings and brought you to myself now therefore this is God's constant refrain we heard the Israelites refrain now God's constant refrain if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession at, of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. That should echo back to God's words to a man called Abram that God called out of Ur and called into a new place and said, I am going to make of you a great nation and I will give you land and blessings and your descendants will be like the stars in the sky and the grains of sand in the ocean. So here God is reiterating, you are my chosen people. So Moses went and summoned the elders of the people and set before them all of these words that the Lord had commanded him. And the people answered him. Now we're going to try this. As one, we're going to do this together. Ready? One, two, three. Everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Great. We're all good. Got through that little bumpy patch in the wilderness. We're at Sinai. Awesome. Moses reported to these words the people of the Lord. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to come to you in a dense cloud in order that the people may hear when I speak with you and so trust you ever after. And here is where we get, this is Exodus 20. Here is where we get the Ten Commandments, where the Lord gives the Ten Commandments to the people. And notice what's at the very top of the list. The Lord spoke all these words 
I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery, and you shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them. That sounds really clear. A little further on, he even goes a little bit more to give some reinforcement to that concept. The Lord says to Moses, you shall say to the Israelites, you have seen for yourselves how I spoke with you from heaven. You shall not make gods of silver alongside me, nor shall you make for yourself gods of gold. And he continues, whoever sacrifices to any god other than the Lord alone shall be devoted to destruction. Well, you already heard the text for today, so you know this does not end well. Moses went to the people and told them all the words that the Lord and all the ordinances and the people, here we go, this is going to be your cue again, answered with one voice and said... All the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. Then Moses took the book of the covenant and read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken, we will do and be obedient. You can't make this up. So Moses goes up to the mountain. He takes with him Aaron, his brother, Joshua, his assistant, Nadab and Abihu, and 70 other elders, and they go up the mountain. The Lord says to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there. I will give you tablets of stone with the law and the commandments which I have written for their instruction. So Moses and Joshua went up the mountain, and they instructed the others to wait. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. The cloud covered it for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire atop the mountain in the sight of the Israelites. So imagine you're the Israelites and you're at the bottom of the mountain. You can tell there's something major happening at the top of the mountain, right? And you've already heard God's voice and you've heard the commandments for yourselves. So Moses enters the cloud and is up on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. When God finished speaking with Moses on Mount Sinai, he gave them the two tablets of the covenant written of of stone, written with the finger of God. (laughs) Meanwhile, while Moses is up there, Well, that's when we get our text for today. The people throw a giant party. Let's have an idol that we can worship. Let's make this idol of gold and let's worship it. And we hear, you know, they they go to Aaron. Poor Aaron just gives in right away. He doesn't offer any resistance whatsoever. He goes right along with them. And they take their gold and they cast it into the form of an idol in the shape of a calf. And we read about how they worship it. They even talk about here are the gods that led us out of Egypt. What? Have they not been listening at all? Have they not even been paying any attention? How could they be this ignorant? How could God have been any more clear? And 
this is what they do while Moses is on the mountain. You know, that's a challenge for us to wrestle with sometimes. I mean, I, I said in the preview for the sermon today, it's easy for us to just bash the Israelites at this point for just being hard-hearted, stiff-necked, defiant, disobedient, unruly, unfaithful, you name the adjective, throw it in there. And yet I wonder, at times in our lives, despite our knowledge of God's presence in our lives and in the world around us, despite knowing all of the miraculous and amazing things that God has done, despite having God's words being placed very clearly in our hands, sometimes even we do this. We set God aside, or God is out of sight, out of mind, kind of like Moses was for 40 days. We get distracted by other things, and we think, you know, what I'd really like to do right now, you know, what I'd really like to have right now, and it happens to us. It happens to us. Well, we know that it does not turn out well. What the section of the by the by the way, the section of Exodus that we get today is the PG part of the story. Keep keep reading. Um, it's not pretty. Uh, then Moses turned, and what you know what's happening is God realizes this is going on, and God says to Moses, "You better get back down there, because guess what." These people that you led, this is what they're doing. And God, now God's blood pressure is way up. And that takes some doing. God is ready to just say, forget it. I'm going to start all over. Kind of like with Noah and the flood, right? Just saying, listen, I've done everything. I, I've had it with these people. Moses is actually the one that has to talk God off the ledge and say, but God, you know, remember that promise you made to Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and you delivered your people and, and, and we do hear in the text for today that yes, God changes his mind and relents, but he does send Moses down the mountain. And so Moses heads back down the mountain, carrying the two tablets of the covenant in his hands, tablets that were written on both sides, written on the front and the back. The tablets were the work of God, and the writing was the writing of God engraved on the tablets. Moses and Joshua are coming back down, and they, they hear this noise, and they're like, what is going on? It sounds like there's a war happening down there. They got a little closer. No, it doesn't sound like battle. What in the world is going on? And, of course, we know what they find when they get down there. As soon as Moses came to the camp and saw the calf and the dancing, Moses' anger burned hot and he threw the tablets from his hands and broke them at the foot of the mountain. Yeah, I encourage you to, at your own discretion, continue reading after this section of Exodus 32. But it does, it does get very violent. Um, it is one of the probably most tragic scenes uh, in the Bible where God's people then turn against each other, uh, those who were faithful and those who were not. And sometimes that even happens to us. We decide maybe which side we're on, the faithful, we are the faithful, they are the unfaithful, and we go after each other. We judge, we criticize. They were all at fault. They had all failed to listen, to be faithful, 
to honor God's instructions. So, you know me, you know I love the Bible. My, my wish for all of you as you continue in this narrative lectionary and really just as you continue the faith is to get into God's word and listen. Not just read, but listen. And know that God speaks to you through all of these stories. These aren't just stories in a book somewhere. This is God's active engagement with people in their lives. Learn from the lessons, because there are a lot of lessons to learn from in, the, in all of the Bible. We see that in the Old Testament and the New Testament. But we also hear that God is always faithful, that God always finds a way to work through our stubbornness, our distractions, our selfishness, our doubts, and God stays faithful. And God continues to lead the people. God led the people all the way from Mount Sinai. They get another copy of the Ten Commandments. They get a do-over. And they build the Ark of the Covenant. They place them in there. and They stay in the wilderness. They disobey God again. And again, and again, and God sticks with them. They also get it right many times. And the rest of scripture is this story of God continuing to try to find ways to reach into people's hearts and lives and to say, keep me first. Whatever else you do in your life, keep me first first in your thoughts in your words in your actions in your decisions in your lifestyle in the way that you interact with other people God says keep me first every Sunday we come here and we start the worship service off by saying God we're sorry we didn't get it right this week either. And God knows that. And God loves us despite all of those failures. And God loves us despite knowing that we are going to screw it up. But calls us to come back and come back and come back to confess and to repent, to receive the sacraments and God's love and forgiveness and to remember that God's covenant promise is eternal we can rejoice in that. Yes, we can chuckle at the misfortunes of the Israelites. But we know sometimes we're just like them. And yet God loved them and God loved us despite all of that. Thanks be to God. Amen. We continue with our sermon hymn, O Father, We Have Wandered. <laughs> <laughs> 